Hi, this is Charlie Montefriello with Blue Bear Flutes, bluebearflutes.com, our website, our Instagram's under Blue Bear Flutes. If you look up Blue Bear Flutes and you can't find us, please comment below and let me know. Uh, in any case, uh, today what we're going to be making is one of our wooden walking stick flutes. We have been carrying walking stick flutes for years and years and years and years. And finally, um, I guess some time ago, probably about 10 years ago, I started making them out of wood. Eventually down the road, I started selling a lot of them out of wood. And then even further down the road from that, I've just about decided not to sell them out of wood anymore, simply because we have such a catalog of flutes that we make that uh, the amount of them that we sell probably doesn't make it really justified to, to make them. Anyway, long story short, today I'm going to show you how to make your own. And uh, I'm not telling you to make your own. I'm not telling you that you should go off and buy a bunch of power tools and do this crazy stuff because it is unsafe. Do you want to see my fingers? Okay. Anyway, so this is actually a wound from dropping a tool on me. I mean, I wasn't even using the tool. It was unplugged and it fell. And oh my gosh. So, long story short, I'm not telling you to do this. I'm just telling you how, uh, theoretically, in case you wanted to imagine that you were going to build that one day. So, what I have done is I've taken a 2x6, a pine 2x6 for construction purpose material, and I've cut it to about 56 inches long. 56 inches, a lot of you are like, well, my walking stick is this long, and I need one that's 53 and 3 quarters. No, it's going to be 56. So, having said that, this is a piece of that 2x6. The other pieces of it are actually laying right up here. I've already cut them into slabs. Um, basically, what I did was I set the depth of my table saw, the amount that was going to cut off with the fence. I'm just going to give you a number here just to try to appease those who need these numbers. 20 millimeters or basically three quarters of an inch, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, and I slabbed it into four pieces there, left this one to slab later on down the road if I need to make another walking stick loop because they store a lot easier when they're thicker, simply because the wood is less likely to warp from humidity. So anyway, beautiful white pine that we're going to be using today. This is my walking stick flute pattern. It is so easy. You don't even need this pattern to do this. I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. We're going to first measure, keep in mind this sucker is 56 inches long, we're going to first measure about 16 inches. And that's where I'm going to move this down to 18 inches. Okay, so when we get to 18 inches, the first thing I'm going to do is mark a little mark right there. Okay, that's 18 inches from here to there, and then about three inches. Now, let's make it easy on you. So, an inch north of there, just ahead of it, we're going to make another mark. And then, around three, you know, I don't really, you can go wherever you wanted, but really, let's put it at three. About three inches, we're going to make another mark. And then, coming down this direction, at about 17 and a half, 17 and a half inches. That's like right there from somewhere. Oh yeah, <laughs> from this first mark that we made. Not this one or that one, but the first one where this piece of wood has not moved. We're going to mark 17 inches. And, fortunately you guys didn't see that, but anyway, this is going to be like the bulk of our pattern. This, all of that right there. And then somewhere past the 17 inch mark, it doesn't really matter where, we're going to put one more mark. So we have a mark at 18 inches from the top. We move north about an inch and then we move north about three inches from our first mark. From that first mark, we also move 17 inches down here and some arbitrary number down here that doesn't really matter as long as it's past 17 inches. Okay, easy peasy. So the next thing I'm gonna do is kind of line this up a little bit. I'm gonna draw some straight lines across so that those marks appear as a line. There is a mathematical reason why I'm doing this that I will never tell you. So the next thing we're going to do, I don't know if you noticed that just now while I was talking, I flipped the wood upside down. 
I'm going to mark it there, and there, and there. Then I'm going to come back and mark it over here and here. And guess what? Now we have marks on both sides of the wood, kind of. We're going to line these up, hold it together firmly. Now we flipped it back up. We're going to mark the lines over here and here. This is real old school flute making right here. Using a router, mind you, and a Sharpie. If I had to promote some company and they weren't going to pay me, it was probably going to be Sharpie. They are really pretty good markers. All the generic ones are terrible. Sharpie, though, they got it going on. Doesn't matter what brand marker you use. Anyway, so the next thing I'm going to do, well, using my pattern, which I have marks up here, so that, once again, these are my scribbles. Not really super important. I'm going to set my depth of my router bit here to 10.85 millimeters. It doesn't have to be perfect, and I'm sure if we looked up the standard equivalent, it would probably make more sense, but I always use metric on the depth. So we're going to say this is 10.85 millimeters. There's 10.20. It's probably about 10.90 or 11. Ooh, look at that, 10.85. Dang, I'm good. Look at that, that's crazy. I should win the lottery now. Anyway, turn that off. Now we're going to set the fence. So this is a standard 2x4 two two thickness. Keep in mind, the 2x4, if we laid it out, would be like this way. Well, 2x6, two 2x4. Two and then I slabbed it. So it's the standard thickness that a 2x6 two or 2x4 two typically are. And that is... Let's look at that number. Somewhere around one and a half. Nice two inches there, hardware store. Anyway, so it's about one and a half inches wide, which is important if you're gonna be using a three quarters inch router bit. The box doesn't say three quarters. It says some crazy cockamamie stuff like three eighths, and they're talking about the radius. But this is a core box or a flute router bit. And it's a roughly 19 millimeters or three quarters of an inch wide. Just ignore that I told you 20 millimeters was three quarters of an inch earlier. It's not as 19. But um, anyway, it's about three quarters of an inch wide. And we have set it so that it's about 10.85 above the top of my saw here, or my router table rather. I will get this together. And our first cut is going to be at a quarter of an inch with the fence. So we have to set the fence to a quarter of an inch. And don't worry about these lines either. Those are scribblings of a madman, if you didn't realize that already. Okay. Actually, what most of you don't realize is this is actually a map to El Dorado. Anyway, so let me grab some ear protection because this here tool is crazy loud. So, look how nice the inside of this looks. Isn't that sweet? So, what I've done was basically I routed one side where that side is close to the fence, and then I turned it around and routed the other side where that side was then close to the fence. And if you notice, I did it one way and then I did it the other way. I want to explain a little bit of that to you guys because I don't want anybody to get hurt if you do attempt something crazy like this. Okay, first of all, the router, there's a line up here. The router is only designed to cut in one direction. That's important. So basically, when you cut like this, the bit only spins around in this direction, and that blade takes wood off of the edge of it there. It takes it off of whatever side that is. So 
So that that's really, you're pushing against the flow of the blade when you go that way. That's why I'm doing that. When I turn it around and cut the other way, and I've talked about this in some of my other videos, I'm actually cutting wood off of the back side of it with this particular flute. And the tension, because the front side of it is this way a little bit further, it's not actually even touching the blade, only the back side of it is. So the back side has the tension against it, and I'm pushing this way, and that causes it to put force against the wood, and it's not trying to yank it out of my hands. If I were to run just a plain piece of wood through this thing backwards, it would go and just go off into the side of my shop and uh, probably hurt me in the process. That's why you got to be so careful. You have to know how to use this kind of equipment. It's not something for everybody. Once again, if you are a skilled flute maker and you have made flutes before and just thought you might want to make a walking stick flute, that's really who this is for. Um, but any of you, you know, anybody can do this. You don't have to have a router. I've had other videos where I've used a hand a draw knife uh, to cut the inside of a flute out. I made hundreds of flutes that way in my youth. In my youth. Okay. Um, these days I use tools. I do drop them on myself sometimes. You know, I had cut actually this finger off with a table saw before. One time a piece of wood I like blacked out and a piece of wood shot and hit me in the chest. I don't know what happened. It was so weird. But uh, it knocked me for a loop. It was really painful. And I had a big bruise. It looked like I was in a car accident or something. Um, anyway, this line here, if you notice, we cut past it for a reason. That line's there for something down the road. We'll worry about it later on. The first line, though, from here, the first dot that we drew, the first actual mark we made on this piece of wood is for the body of the, of the flute. That's the body of the flute, the chamber that makes the sound. The next set of lines, those are for the air chamber. So that's where we're at there. I've done this on both pieces. The next thing we've got to do is adjust this so that we can cut the middle out of it and make it nice and round. So we're going to change it to 5 sixteenths. One thing, if I could make a suggestion I would do over again, is I would have cut this board just a little bit thicker. So instead of making it the uh, 20 millimeter stick, I would have made it probably somewhere around 30 millimeter stick. That would be a lot better for you. simply because it's more margin for error. You don't want your router bit poking through your flute while you're working on it. That's terrible. Ideally, I even use a different pattern these days than this old one, but this one here works good with 2 by 4s is the reason I'm using it. So uh, the next thing I did, I set my fence here to 5 sixteenths of an inch. The reason I did that is because now we're gonna we're gonna carve out the middle, the the rise, if you would, the center where it's not currently round because right now it's like two flat sides. Um, we're gonna make that round in the middle and set that to five sixteenths. And this is gonna be it's supposed to be twelve and a half, but I'm gonna go with twelve twenty five because I don't want to come through my wood. And if you have any doubts. 12.25 millimeters in comparison to 19 or 20 millimeters that we have here. Um, we're going to have roughly six and three quarters millimeters on top. Let me show you how thick six and three quarters millimeters are. You can question whether or not it's thick enough for you. That's how thick the wall of this flute is. So really you've seen me plane things off and whatnot in the past, I'm not really going to be playing this one off. It's just going to be rounded off on our big roundover machine, which we're going to get to tomorrow for you to, to see, and then we'll run it through a different lathe so that I can sand it real nice and fine. So, off. that's not a, enough confusion there for you. Let's go ahead and cut this part of it. We'll just stop what we're doing and do something else. Okay, I should probably apologize to you guys. My camera person back here is shaking her head because you guys see me clean that tabletop off. I need it flat so that this thing here works well. And really, I usually keep my, my uh, little hand broom up here because I can run this across the bit while it's running and it won't grab it or hurt me. <laughs> Whereas, 
when I put my fingers up a half inch away from it, that's kind of in the no-no point. Um, but anyway, when I was telling you a moment ago that these lines don't really matter, I use those for some of our flutes that we make. For this particular flute, I have a guide. You can't really see it too good, but it's drawn right here. And I just took a marker and drew the width of my router bit. That way I know where it starts and where it stops cutting. So that's the purpose of that. And that's why we have these lines on the flute blank so that we can use this for start and stop points. So as I'm cutting there, I know right where it's gonna start cutting and where it's going to stop cutting. You know, it's just, it's how it works. It works out pretty well. Next thing I do, I pick the prettiest side of the wood and I mark this and then I'll tell you where the measurements go. This is for a key of E, walking stick flute. There was a time when we used to offer different keys. And then we got to where we only offered the key of E, which is really the best. Ideally, the key of E walking stick is a nice low tone. And at the same time, it uh, is large enough that it will support the weight of someone my size, which is around 200 pounds. And then it'll also uh, not be too thick walled because we can make a key of A walking stick flute out of something this big in diameter, but then it's gonna be a really thick walled flute and it's gonna sound like something that's got a lot of lacquer on it, that's made out of some Brazilian hardwood. And uh, some of you might be into that kind of thing, but I like my wood to sing. I don't want it to sound like I'm playing a tin whistle. So, uh, you know, I make it out of something that's softer because the, the softer wood, not too soft, mind you. Um, who was it? Uh, George Washington actually had hardwood flooring in his house made out of yellow pine. So uh, there's some debate over whether, uh, despite if it's a conifer or if it drops its deciduous, it drops its leaves or whatever, there's some debate over whether pine is actually hardwood. Likewise, we use a lot of uh, uh, poplar and poplar in some respects is softer than pine in so many ways although poplar is a hardwood so there's some debate over these kind of things you know let me tell you pine makes a really excellent sounding flute hands down uh, it might be a simple a common uh, something you can get from any hardware store piece of wood but it really does make an excellent sounding flute anyway all that aside let's measure some of these holes here so that y'all know where to put these fingerings and two you know I, I should mention we do have a previous video we made uh, where I made a flute uh, a walking stick flute or a bow staff flute we called it out of a piece of PVC and that's something that you know really anybody can do uh, doesn't take a whole lot of skill we've got multiple videos on making PVC flutes um, so it's not something that you can't do without a little bit of ease uh, but like I said this is really for those who want to make something out of wood there goes my compressor. So the first hole fingering we marked is at six and a half inches. The next one is at seven and a half inches. The next one is an eighth pass nine and a half inches. So the one after that is at ten and seven eighths. And then we're at twelve inches. So recap. Six and a half inches is the first fingering. The next one is seven and a half inches. Then we're at uh, a eighth of an inch past nine and a half inches. <laughs> like my measuring. Anyway, then we're at ten and seven eighths. Then we're at twelve inches. Okay. And then I've also gone and marked this line that we have here. I've marked it on the inside because I'm going to drill that out also with a bigger bit. You can watch me do that for a second. And then we'll burn it and glue it together so it'll be ready for tomorrow. Just keep drilling, just keep drilling. <laughs> just keep drilling. Okay, change the drill out. Here we go. That's a 3 16 drill bit. You can drill it with 3 16 or a quarter, whichever fits your fancy. Eventually going to be changing the size of some of those holes, just a smidgen. They're going to go between a quarter and five sixteenths. 
I have a reason I do all this stuff. There's a method to my madness. Actually, I don't have any madness. So, uh, they say denial is the first symptom. Okay, this is a uh, 5 8 drill bit that I'm drilling that middle hole out from the bottom. And it looks like my drill bit is not deep enough, so I did not drop anything just now. You guys did not see that. The camera person is not shielding their eyes. Everything's fine. There we go. And there's some holes. So, we have fingerings. We have a sound uh, escape hole or tuning hole. We can call it a bunch of different things. And now I'm going to go mortise these holes in. You don't have to, really. You could use a quarter inch bit or a 3 16 bit or not even put the hole in there if you don't want to do it that way. But I like to mortise this stuff in. It's the reason we have a mortiser. And here we go. Ready for some noise. So now that we've got it unclamped, I'm going to put the uh, sound, well, the mouthpiece hole right here. Um, this is where our empty chamber is, where there's an air chamber. And then, of course, here's the air escape, the sound hole. And I like to put the, the mouthpiece right around this area. You could, of course, put it on the other side if you like, but I play it this way, and so do most of the people that we sell them to. So um, that's where that's going to go, just kind of quick.
Okay, so I went ahead and, and flattened the surface of this down with my Forstner bit. Once again, many of you have seen other videos I've made doing this. And then I created a track and the sound hole and got it all nice and neat the way I want it. I also enlarged the size of this hole, the air supply hole that I blow in, the mouthpiece. Um, and in addition to that, I've got a little block that I make for the walking sticks, which is a little different than the other blocks. It basically is one that I tie on with the uh, leather inside, so if something happens and while you're hiking or walking or running away from a bear, if it gets loose, uh, this thing will maybe just kind of wiggle around and not fall off as quickly as one that is just kind of tied on the top. So, so anyway, we do that to try to keep things secure. Of course, we tie them on really tight. Um, but uh, the next thing we have to do is basically uh, tune the flute, and that's pretty easy stuff. I went ahead and burnt these holes out to a quarter of an inch and for right now I'm going to put a clamp on here. Let's see. Sounds pretty good. And I'm also going to clamp my tuner on here. I've got a different tuner that I'm using these days. Um, we've gone through so many tuners and I really do like my cork that you guys have seen me use in the past and that's probably the reason there aren't any available right now. Uh, you're welcome cork. Anyway, uh, I'm sure the check's in the mail. But uh, anyway, so I couldn't find my cord, so I bought this really majorly generic. It's a Denner, D-E-N-N-E-R. I'm kind of happy with it so far, it's not too bad. And I've never used one of the mic attachments or the clamp-on attachments. These are made for guitars and stringed instruments that create a lot of vibration whenever you plug a string. Uh, it works pretty good for the flute in some cases. High tone flutes, not so much. Low tone flutes, pretty good. Um, and uh, then of course you can use just the, the mic, just like on a cord tuner. This tuner is not as sensitive as my cord is. And that's my biggest concern with it. It's great otherwise. You can tune up and down for 420, uh, 432 and, and uh, 444, you know, if you wanna make it 528 hertz. Um, it's also got a few other features that my cord doesn't have, which is great. Um, it's, it's pretty nice for the most part. However, like I said, you get used to something, you know how that is. Um, when I use this one with a high tone flute, I actually have to put the sound hole really close to the microphone so that it picks it up better. Medium and low tone flutes, it does kind of okay as long as there's not a lot of distracting noises. But so far with this thing, it's been pretty good. So let me take a look. Well, it's not picking up at all. Maybe it's not slid in all the way. Let's see. Let's see if it makes a difference. Now see, there's an example. It's, it's actually on the low tone flute picking up the vibrations that are closer to the top fingerings than the bottom fingerings. So maybe if I try the mic. Or maybe if I unplug this guy. Let me try that. So it looks like the bottom note is an E flat, which is a D sharp. And if you notice the E scale, this is my old messed up cheat sheet here from forever ago. Um, it goes E, G, A, B, D, and E. That's the minor pentatonic E scale from the lowest to the highest note. Um, what we need to do first is zero in on the lowest note, which is the E. And the way we do that is enlarge the bottom hole here with my Dremel. In so many ways, enlarging the air escape there actually makes it play better in the long run. But uh, for this, It'll actually tune it. Now it's just a pinch flat of E, which I'm going to go ahead and make it a little bit, a little bit larger, which will bring the hole in just a little bit bigger and bring the bottom note in a little bit sharper.
You're going to be careful not to take too much out because that sawdust that has built up in there from dremeling actually causes it to go flat as well. So if I blow the sawdust out, it's going to go sharp all of a sudden. Now, stay right here. Watch that tuner. I'm going to go blow this out, and I'll be right back. Let's see if that made a difference. Big difference. It actually brought it right in tune. So that's good on the bottom note. Let's see what the next fingering up sounds like. So it's about a half step off, which means I'm going to go ahead and burn it out with this larger tool. And typically, at this point, I know I can go ahead and burn out these others as well. just a pinch flat that's probably a pinch right there let's see what this one does this one this one if you've only made a flute or two I'd suggest not enlarging the other holes until you're ready two notes are a half step off and that A or the B rather is just a pinch off so I'm going to make the B a little bit bigger and then I'm going to have to put up my larger track tool or a hole tool for just a second. So I still got to bring these two holes in a little bit. I'm going to check on that one really quick here. Take out just a little bit, a little bit more up here. Once again, if you haven't uh, made a lot of flutes, I wouldn't suggest enlarging all the holes at the same time. Because depending on how your, your track and your sound hole are, and how the pattern works for you and your fingerings and everything, you may be making a mistake by making this one larger or anything of the sort. So. two are still just a little bit flat. I do have a larger hole tool, but I'm going to stick with this 3 8 tool that I've got right here. The holes only need to be a little bit larger. Another word of warning too, don't go around circles like this. I do this because I can feel how much the fire and the heat's taken off of the wood at a time, but unless you've been doing it for a while, I would not go that direction because it tends to break your your flute. At least that's the way it was when I first started. Sorry about that. My finger's very hot on that hole. Let me play it just for a 
second here. So I'm just going to take a tiny bit more out. I noticed in one of my last videos I sounded a little congested and I know I, I have to sound that way on this video. We've been spending a lot of time in the shop here lately and anytime we do that, I don't know if you know about sawdust, but my gosh, I tell you what, there is a lot of sawdust up in this joint. As a matter of fact, this pink siding that you see in our shop here is actually insulation. We're working on getting everything insulated and, and closed up because we have a new dust collector and it is actually in the room behind me here and it's as big as a VW Beetle. I mean it's a big dust collector uh, and we're going to be turning it on here in just about a week or so. We've got a lot of irons in the fire, a lot of neat stuff coming up too so I'm looking forward to some of the some of the funny videos we have planned, some of the serious ones that people have been asking for, how to do this and how to do that. Uh, we've got tons of playing videos because those are the things that people ask for the most these days. Um, but just lots of lots of great stuff coming up. And like I said, this dust collector back here is going to keep my sinuses clear, which will be great. <laughs> One last look and then it's just a light sanding, oil it, wax it, tie this block on, put my bear on the back of it and we're done. There she goes. So that's about it for that. I'm going to just sand it here real quick and oil it and wax it and then I'll show you guys what it looks like because when it's finished, uh, I always feel like, you know, I guess it's for me as a flute maker, the completion of it being done is just like the epitome of, you know, the whole creation process. But when it's finished and it's oiled and waxed, it always sounds a lot better. And that's why I like to, uh, I might shut off some of our fans and stuff for a minute so that you can hear it better because it's, it's going to really sing, I can tell already. Uh, I'll be right back. So, once again, when it's finished and waxed and oiled, I think they look so cool. I mean, as I had mentioned before, pine is an amazing wood for making flutes out of. Medium lightness, kind of uh, medium to hard hardness, depending on what type of pine you get. And it just resonates really well. So it makes a really jam up walking stick, in my opinion. So it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, one thing I didn't show you all did, I went ahead and rounded the top off and I rounded the bottom off just to give it kind of a, um, not generic, but like a multi-purpose type, uh, I guess, placid. Is it a word? What am I saying there? Anyway, uh, so that way it's kind of soft on your hands and soft on the ground when you stab the dirt with it or some for some reason or not. It looks good anyway. So I uh, tied the block on, got it all oiled on the inside, which is really important because the pores of wood actually uh, slow the air flow down and when you oil it, it actually helps to seal them a little bit. So that's kind of nice. Uh, got my little bear burned on the back of it. So uh, anyway. This is what it sounds like. The only thing we have running right now are these two fires, which you can probably hear hissing pretty good. Maybe I'll step this way just a pinch.
So a really good sounding flute. I'm very happy with it. And no doubt before we package this one up and get it shipped off to whoever it's going to, uh, you'll see a video of it and probably some pictures of it on our Instagram page. So make sure you check out our Instagram. Uh, anyway, as I had mentioned before, make sure that if you're planning on doing something like this, undertaking such a procedure that you're at least a mildly skilled woodworker, please be very careful and very safe. Uh, don't cut any digits off and don't get hit by tools. Make sure that your eyes are good. If you knew how many times I used a magnet to pull pieces of metal fragment out of my eyes and everybody's in the, in the home going, <gasps> you know, it's, that's how they do it. I mean, they do it at, at the doctor like that, so why wait? I just keep a magnet in the shop just in case. But I wear those goggles all the time these days. As you see, I have them up here ready to go. That's exactly why they're there. Um, anyway, so make sure you use any kind of protection, uh, ear protection, eye protection, gloves if that helps you, if you're in a situation where gloves are important. Um, but once again, not telling you you should make this flip. I really am not telling you to do it. If you do it, more power to you. And, uh, you know, thank you. My hat's off to you. But if you don't do it, that's okay. We have a video on how to make it out of PVC, so make sure you go back and look at that and find our bow staff slash walking flute video, a walking stick flute video out of PVC, which I really enjoy playing mine. I mean, for a PVC flute, something that size, it resonates pretty well. So once again, like I say, more pictures and videos on Instagram, I'm sure. If you guys have any questions, comments, positive ones, negative ones, Mr. Thumbs Down, anybody, please drop me a line in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. I always look at my phone when that comment pops up and think, wow, I really could have bought one-way tickets to somewhere or another or whatever somebody's advertising when they put up one of those crazy comments that I have to delete. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you guys so very much for watching us. And once again, keep uh, playing that flute if you got one. If you don't, let's talk. This is Charlie Matotuyela signing out for Blue Bear Flutes and BlueBearFlutes.com. You'll find us on Instagram and Facebook the same way. Y'all take care and happy flute playing. Thank you.